welcome. We are right in the heart of the living space of the British Library, with reading rooms on every side. Beneath your feet are stacks of millions of books and priceless artifacts, and the treasure gallery is just over there. It's open, it's free, this is your library. I'm Bea Rolat of the Cultural Events team. I'd like to thank our online audience and welcome everybody to this evening of deathless monsters of damp and petulant sea creatures, of bubbling globules of blood, and the jellied scoop of eyes being pulled from sockets. It's just another night at the British Library. We're here, of course, for Natalie Haynes's brilliant telling of the story of Medusa, perhaps the best known and most wildly interpreted of the Greek myths. Medusa is something of a Rorschach test, um, a, a Random sprinkling of quotes has Helene Sixou, the French feminist, saying she's not deadly, she's beautiful and she's laughing. Uh, for Donatella Versace, Medusa, uh, Medusa is a symbol. It's about going all the way. And for Carol Ann Duffy, speaks through her in the lines, there are bullet tears in my eyes, are you terrified? And Freud thought it was all about castration. Well, if you want the truth, you really need to buy this book. Now, please welcome to the stage, Natalie and Monique. <laughs> um, Natalie, we will be joined shortly by Lisa Dewan, and Natalie is with our chair, Monique Roffey. Now, Monique is, please welcome Monique, before my snakes wiggle off again. Feel free to um, avail yourselves of these snaky headdresses, everybody. <laughs> Monique is very beloved of the British Library. She's a multi-award winning writer whose most recent novel, The Mermaid of Black Conch, was the Costa Book of the Year 2020. It's an unforgettable book. I love it. And it was also, it's also on sale tonight, so knock yourself out and buy both. There will be time for questions later, both here and for our online audience. And our signature drink of the evening is, of course, Snake Bite and Black. Do you see what we did there? But for now, please join me in one more welcome for Natalie and Monique. Hi, good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, it's such an, a pleasure to be here. I am so excited um, by uh, Natalie's book. Uh, before we kick off, I'm just going to uh, introduce Natalie and Lisa, um, who are both, uh, gosh, between them, got so many accolades. I think we're going to, Lisa's going to read um, to start with. Yes, please. Um, so I'll introduce Lisa. Lisa Dwan is an Irish performer and writer. She stars in the Top Boy and Bloodland series, and her theatre work includes a one-woman production of her adaptation of Samuel Beckett's Nose Knife. Duan writes and teaches on theatre, culture, gender, and Beckett. She's a visiting professor at Princeton University and was artist in residence at Columbia University, where she developed a new theatre piece with Margaret Atwood based on Medea. Um, and Natalie Haynes is a writer and broadcaster, and according to the Washington Post, a rock star mythologist. Someone's got to be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How many of those do we know? Um, her previous books are The Amber Fury, The Ancient Guide to Modern Life, um, The Children of Jocosta, A Thousand Ships, which was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction, um, and Pandora's Jar, Women in Greek Myth. Six series of her show, Natalie Hayne Stands Up for the Classics, has been broadcast on Radio 4, all available on BBC Sounds. So, can you give it up for Natalie and Lisa? Uriali liked humans. She knew Stenel preferred to avoid them, finding their fragility strange and unpleasant. But even before Medusa came to them, Uriali used to fly inland and watch them. She liked the way they were so prone to anxiety and haste. She liked the houses they made for themselves to sleep inside. She liked the huge temples they managed to build. She would return to the coast to tell Steno of all she had seen, but she knew her sister was only listening because she was kind. But Medusa was different. 
She asked for the stories over and over again, correcting Uriali if she changed any detail. She pestered both sisters to be allowed to see people whenever she could. She loved seeing children, just as she loved it when their horned sheep produced lambs. And as she had grown older, her love for mortals only increased. They don't even have wings, Steno said one morning, when Medusa was pleading for the three of them to go and see the new temple, which had been built a little way along the coast. The Gorgons could see it from the top of their own rocky heights, though it was on a loftier promontory. I wonder how they got the columns up so high. We could ask them if we went to look, Medusa said. Please, not today, Steno said. There are things I need to do today, but another day, Uriali said. The sheep needed milking, and she had a feeling one of them was sickening with something. She had penned the little creature away from the others on the far side of the shore. I could go on my own, Medusa said. Her sisters looked at one another. She could go on her own. She was of an age when humans did things alone, Uriali realized, and although it took a physical effort to remember, she was no longer a baby. How many summers have you been here, Steno asked, suspicious. I remember 13, Medusa said. How many do you remember, she asked Uriali. Three more, Uriali said after a moment of counting. She thought of her flock of sheep growing through the years, the first lambs, the first deaths. She remembered Medusa being there each time, crawling, then standing, then walking unsteadily, then running. Yes, she nodded to her skeptical sister. She has been with us for 16 summers. If I was mortal, my parents would let me go and see a temple, Medusa said, turning from one sister to the other. Please, I think they're starting another one. I'm sure I saw them marking out the space. I want to see. Medusa wasn't afraid to be traveling alone. She was often on her own in the caves where they lived or on the rocks around their patch of the shore. She was never far from her sisters, and she enjoyed the brief sense of solitude she felt when she left them behind. She unfurled her wings and flew the short distance to the temple precincts. Now she was close to it. She was even more dazzled by the ingenuity and grandeur. Vast, sturdy columns were topped by a brightly painted frieze, and Medusa wondered how mortals standing at their base would ever be able to see the story of the war between the gods and the titans, a story her sisters had told her many times without craning their necks. The whole edifice seemed to have been designed to be admired by someone who could fly. She fluttered up to look more closely at the painted figures, which ran all the way around the outside edge of the roof, the blues, reds, and yellows, each catching her eye in turn. She followed the story around, panel by panel, the titans rising up against Zeus, the Olympian gods banding together to subdue them. When she landed back on the ground, she wondered where the mortals were. She could see none. She, she wanted to look inside the temple, but Steno had taught her to be careful of scaring humans who were apt to scream and run away if they saw a gorgon. Perhaps they had already seen her approaching the temple and hidden. Still, she stood behind a column and pushed open one wooden door just a little, hoping not to alarm anyone. She peered inside, her eyes accustomed to the darkness of her cave. She saw a pair of bright, unblinking eyes staring right at her, and she gasped before realizing they belonged to a statue. She smiled as she pushed the door further and stepped inside. The statue was so impressive, no wonder it had made her jump. The goddess sat proudly on her grand chair, her skin glowing white, her helmet, spear and shield painted gold. Her eyes were remarkable. Medusa didn't know what could have made them such a piercing blue. She'd never seen such a thing, and yet she knew it was such a perfect likeness that the goddess had just such eyes herself. She crept a little closer, admired the drapery of the statue's dress, reached out to touch it, but pulled her hand back when she heard a noise behind her. Don't stop on my account. I must say it's a rather good likeness of my niece. Medusa turned to see who was speaking. A tall, well-muscled man was standing in the shadows of the colonnade by the tour she had just used. He must have been waiting to follow her in, she thought, when he could have simply have spoken to her outside. 
He had long black hair curling down past his neck. His eyes were dark green and cold. Your niece, she said. Is that who that is? Of course, he replied. That is Athene. Can't you tell from the helmet and the spear? Uh, I didn't know she had those, Medusa said. My sisters don't always mention what people are wearing when they tell the stories. He laughed, but she could tell the laughter was false. It did not sound like Steno laughing when she caught herself doing something ridiculous or when Uriali was entertained by the antics of their sheep. It sounded like Medusa searched for the words to define something unfamiliar. Like the laughter of someone who wanted to be thought amused, though they were not. Why are you pretending to laugh? She asked. The man stopped laughing immediately. I wasn't laughing at your sisters, he said. You weren't laughing at all, she replied. I was thinking how funny it is, he continued as though she had not spoken, that you are the daughter of a sea god and sea goddess, and yet you only know your immortal kin through stories. <laughs> Medusa did not know what to say to this, since the man was lying to her, and she'd no idea why. She found herself suddenly wishing that Uriali had left her sheep for a while and come with her, or that the priestess of the mighty goddess Athene were present, or that the tall man wasn't so close to the door. How do you think I should know them, she said. She moved to the side of the statue, and the man moved silently in the same direction, so the distance between them was lessened. I think your sister should have taken you to Mount Olympus to meet your ethereal family, he said. Or perhaps they could have brought you to my kingdom instead. My borders lap up against your shore after all. Are you my father? she asked, and this time his <coughs> laughter was real, but again, it sounded wrong. She realized because it was tinged with contempt. <laughs> no, child. Forcus is a very minor god compared to his king. Poseidon, she said. Don't you usually have a trident? Do I need one? He asked. I thought your sisters didn't mention what gods wear and carry. She stared at him, wondering why he didn't like her sisters. Ah. I don't know what you use it for, she said. Attacking titans, he replied. You saw me on the freeze outside. That's why you don't have it then, because the titans were overthrown. Exactly. So now I only carry it because I'm used to it, he said. But sometimes it gets in the way. When you visit temples to look at your niece, that's not quite why I'm here. Medusa opened her mouth to ask why he was here before realizing she didn't at all want to know the answer. What's she like? she asked instead. Athene! She's, he thought for a moment, she's sharp. Sharp-eyed, like you see here. Sharp-tongued off and sharp-edged. She's quick to take offense and ruthless when she takes revenge. Zeus spoils her and it makes her less pleasant than she might otherwise be. She's very quick to go crying to him if she doesn't get her way. Medusa looked back at the statue. Huh. I wonder what she'd say about you, she said. I'm sure she would say that I am handsome and charming and you should stop wondering if you could reach the door before I reached you because you already know the answer is no. There was absolute silence. Medusa thought of the sheep and the eagle that had tried to steal one, and again, she wished Uriali was with her now. It wouldn't make any difference anyway, would it, she said. Not really, he replied. I am wherever the sea is, and you can't be with your sisters all the time. So what happens now? Now? You submit to a power greater than your own. Medusa was never aware of it when she was with her sisters because there was always the sound of the sea and the wind and the gulls and the cormorants and their flock. But in this silent space, she was conscious of being the only one whose breath could be heard. It made her feel weak. What if I don't want to? She asked. 
You will want to, he shrugged. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to? I am one of the Olympian gods. You should feel honored that I am singling you out in such a way. It's a privilege you have done nothing to earn. I've seen you and decided to bestow my favor upon you. It wouldn't occur to you not to want to. It will occur to you to say thank you, I suppose. Medusa could not say why she suddenly felt less afraid, though her dislike of the god was in no way diminished. It was, perhaps, because of his tremendous self-regard, which meant that even though he was so much more powerful than her, and so intent on exploiting the disparity between them, she felt rather sorry for him. Imagine being a god, she thought, and still needing to tell everyone how impressive you were. You caused the earthquakes, she said that make the sand shimmer on the shore. I strike my trident on the bed of the sea, he agreed, and the earth trembles at my command. Why do you do it? she asked. Again, she thought she saw a glint of weakness as Poseidon straightened his back, but somehow managed to look still slightly shorter. Because I can. Could you smash? this temple and send it tumbling into the sea, she asked. He nodded. Well, the columns would shatter and the roof would collapse, he said, although it's probably too far from the edge of the cliff for it to fall into the sea. I mean, the columns might roll, I suppose. I'm not asking you to prove it. I don't need to prove it, he snapped. The humans are building my temple now to Poseidon, Earthshaker. <laughs> you must have seen the site as you flew here. Oh, is that going to be a temple to you? She asked. I wonder why they did this one first. I imagine they were honing their skills, he said. <laughs> do you think so? I would have thought they would do the most important gods first, but then I suppose they would have built one for Zeus first, wouldn't they? Not necessarily. Not everyone thinks Zeus is the god the most worthy of honor. Oh, then don't they? No, no. Seafaring people have always built temples to my majesty. Well, yes, I suppose seafaring people would, but these people obviously value you because they're building you a temple now. Of course. I suppose they just honored your niece first because they value her skills and, and perhaps they don't travel much by sea. They have little need to travel anywhere, he said. Their land is fertile and their livestock are strong. Well, perhaps they should build a temple to Demeter next. You're trying to make me angry. I wouldn't have thought I had that power. He stared at her, his green eyes glittering in the half-light. I'm beginning to wonder if you do. Where did you learn to be so brazen? I didn't know I was she said, and I'm sure you know the answer already since you seem to have been watching me. My sisters taught me to be like them. But you aren't like them, are you? You don't have their physical power. You don't have their immortality. There's only a pair of wings differentiating you from any other girl. Your sisters are monsters with their tusks and their snaking manes of hair. You have very little in common with them at all. My sisters aren't monsters. This, then, explained why he did not like them. He was appalled by their appearance. Medusa wanted to laugh, but she was still afraid. As if anything that was important about Steno or Uriali was visible in their teeth or their hair. Aren't you loyal, he said. Can love really have blinded you so much? You're the one who's blind if you can't see anything beyond a pair of tusks. Your alley has two sets of tusks, I believe. It doesn't matter what you believe, she replied. You cannot possibly fail to see what anyone else could see. Why do you think I picked you and not one of your sisters? You know you are beautiful. You know they are not. I know that when you talk of beauty, you mean something different from what I mean. I see. He took a step towards her, and she forced herself not to take a step back. So what do you mean by beauty, little Gorgon? Uriali tends to every one of her sheep like it is a child. 
Steno learned to cook so that she could feed me when I was little. They care about me and they protect me. That is beauty. Neither of them is protecting you now. You waited until I was alone. I did. Very well. If these qualities are so valuable to you, if you really claim to believe that caring and tending are beautiful, when it is so common it is not even limited to humans, any animal cares for its young, then prove it. How? Come here, he said, and he strode towards her, grabbing her hand. She wanted to pull away from him, but she knew immediately that however strong she was, he was much stronger. There was a clamminess to his touch, a smell of seaweed emanating from his skin. He dragged her to the columns closest to the sea and pushed his hand against her back, forcing her to look across the wide promontory. Look, he said, out there towards my temple. What do you see? She was sure the group of girls had not been there when she entered Athene's temple. You already know what I can see, she said. I see a group of girls talking and laughing together. Are they beautiful? Yes, she replied. Why? Because they are young and happy and together, she said. She could feel the irritation in the fingers that pressed against her. They are ordinary, look again. And she did, as he demanded, but she could not see what he saw. It's because you've spent all of these years with no one but your sisters for company. If you'd grown up with other girls your own age, if I had grown up with other girls my own age, you would have thought me ordinary too. Not true, he said. I would have admired those ringlets and those arching eyebrows. I would have approved of your long, straight nose and the way your wide mouth is ready to smile. I would have desired you in just the same way if you'd grown up among all these girls. You would still have been extraordinary. You're just guessing, she said. You can't know that. You just think I want to hear it. She felt the tension in the muscles that held her as she said it, and she knew she was right. He was so very sure of his own charm. But I don't. Very well, he replied. Have it your way. You are nothing more than an ordinary girl with ordinary immortal sisters, and everyone is equally beautiful because you say so. Is that right? He grabbed her by the shoulders and spun her to face him. She could feel the pillar pressing against her back and the smell of salt and anger on his face. You value them all so highly. You think that caring for the weak is so important. Prove it to me and to yourself. She stared at his dark green eyes and loathed him. You can't prove what you believe, she said. You can only believe it. That is obviously not true, he said. You believe you can fly, and I believe it too. We could prove it by taking you to the edge of the cliff and pushing you off it. Flying isn't a matter of opinion, she said, nor is beauty. I don't agree with you. He leaned close and hissed into her mouth. I will take one of those girls, Medusa. Anyone you can choose, I will take her to the deepest part of the ocean and I will have her until she drowns. Do you understand? I will rape her and she will die of it because that is what it means to be weak. They will knock down your temple and never worship you again. Men will worship me across the world, he shrugged. These ones hardly matter. She saw all his vanity and pettiness and wondered why mortals worshipped any god like this. Or, he said, look at me. She could not bring herself to meet his eyes, but he reached out and took her chin, held her face so that she could not look away. Or I will have you. Here, now, in the temple. You've made your disdain for the idea quite clear. So let us see how much you love these mortals, how much you value caring for the weak like your sisters do. She stared at him in disgust. If I agree to this, you leave them all alone? He shrugged. I might. Then yes, 
she said. They will never repay your affection. Do you understand? She nodded. They will fear you and flee you and call you a monster just like they do your sisters. It doesn't matter what they think of me. Then why do you want to protect them? Because I can, she said. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I've got so many questions, but I didn't realize that one of my first would be writer to writer, which is, it's interesting. Do you find it interesting, like, you did that, you wrote that? Yeah. Do you kind of go, oh, that's... <laughs> that's what that should sound like. Yeah, it's a bit awkward because I did the audio book. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Lisa is the third person to perform it because um, it's being done on Radio 4 as a book at bedtime uh -huh. at the moment. Gosh. Um, and I did the audio book. And when we planned this event way back in, I can't remember, um, March or something, Lisa was the first person I, I wanted them to... To ask. I should say I didn't get to cast Radio Force brilliant, brilliant Susanna Fielding to do um, the abridged version there, but, uh, but I sure would have. Um, but Lisa was, I, I've, I've seen Lisa perform on stage a couple of times, and once um, I've, been, I've had a private performance from Lisa over Zoom because I, I did a guest lecture for her students when we were all locked down, and she read a bit of Medea, and I, I, honestly, I wasn't the same for weeks afterwards, so... Yeah, I, I knew that she would see a, a part of the story that I hadn't seen, even if I'd written. Um, and I was right. I'm glad I didn't hear her rehearse. Um, another question I haven't, I haven't planned is, is just in, in the green room, you said that there isn't much of the story of Med Med That's of true. Medusa. Yeah, that's it's actually that's quite a thing. small story. Yeah. And yet here we've got, we've got this incredible... Um, you know, you've just developed it and gone somewhere that feels just mesmerizing and really big. Can you talk about, again, that's kind of, kind of the miracle of imagination. I mean, we've got so much now in this book. Yeah, I, ho I hope so. There's not, I mean, it is a, she's a huge iconographic symbol in the ancient yeah. world. So Gorgonea, the Gorgon heads, appear all over almost all ancient cultures. Heads or masks appear everywhere. They're usually apotropaic. They're meant to protect us. Um, in the case of Gorgons, I think probably from the natural world because of all the, they have snakes for hair, snakes are dangerous, it looks like a lion's mane, lions are dangerous, um, they have these big wide mouths, they're associated etymologically with the notion of thunder and therefore lightning, dangerous, mm -hmm. um, tusks, boars are dangerous, wild boar are dangerous. Um, and so they, they serve this kind of protective role and I felt like that had really been lost because we tend to think of them as monsters. Um, and I think we see them from the outside. You know, look at that scary monster that could turn me to stone. Whereas, conversely, for example, we look at someone like Midas, who could kill you just as easily by turning you to gold. We look at from the inside. We're like, oh, poor Midas. It would be awful if everything I touched turned sure. to gold and I couldn't eat or drink. Yeah. And so that kind of central tension, why do we look at his story from the inside? Why do we look at hers from the outside? Was yeah. really where I kind of started out. But no, there's not. There's a version of... The, there's a narrative version of the story of Medusa and Perseus in Ovid's Metamorphoses, but it's largely focused on Perseus. Mm. Everyone dies of surprise. Um, there are brief mentions of her in Pindar, in Hesiod, and in a few other sources, but there's really not a lot. The, the, what you get is loads of vase paintings, so you get lots of snapshots of the story. Um, and, and it felt like, therefore, it, it was up to me to put it into, to turn it into a long narrative and then up to people who perform it, someone like Lisa, to find all the depth in, inside that narrative. And, yeah. And bring it I mean, to one the of audience. the lines from that is, um, why do we worship gods like this? Yeah. And I, I think uh, something about um, the inherent misogyny and in this world and these gods are sociopaths and narcissists. They really are. And Lisa really captured that sort of, you know, <laughs> who do you think you are? Rah, rah. And, um, I, and yet, there's so little revision. They can't, these, these stories are kind of frozen. And they're kind of, we see um, 
the word, the names of the gods everywhere, mm. all the time. No one's really shaken, they're not to be shaken up, but you're, that's what you're doing. And I, I kind of wanted to ask you, why is revision necessary of these stories, and especially feminist revision? Well, because they were revised for a really long time, and then I think we sort of lost our way a little bit for reasons that I'm not entirely sure of, except that people stopped believing in gods like that, I suppose. But I'm not really sure how you believed in, in those gods to begin with, because it's really difficult. People ask me the question quite a lot. It's like, did Socrates believe in, you know, Zeus and Hera squabbling on Mount Olympus? Because that seems, and it's like, well, I, I can't answer that for you. But the question of what do we, how do we consider piety is one that's been being asked since the fourth century BC. There's a Plato dialogue called the Euthyphro. And the question is, what, what's pious? What's, what's something kind of godly? Is it things that the gods love that make them godly? Or is it the other way around? Do they become godly because the gods already love them? Uh, you know, and so is it a freestanding godliness and that's why the gods love them or is it predicated on their precarious affections? But the Euthyphro, who's in dialogue with Socrates, says, oh, well, you know, we love whatever the gods love. And then the question comes back, well, what about when the gods don't agree? So this is a question that's been being asked, you know, in the Iliad, the gods are squabbling the entire time. And that's, you know, the Homeric version. So that's late 8th, early 7th century BCE. And, and they never agree on anything. Here is always trying to trick Zeus. Zeus is really violent towards her. He's an abusive husband. She's in an abusive relationship. Um, most gods' relationships are, are abusive by any modern standards, and indeed sometimes by ancient standards. If I just stands up for his mum and he gets <coughs> thrown off Mount Olympus, that's just abuse. So I, I, I hear you, I, but I still think in terms of sort of, there's lots of strong women, for example, in these stories. Everybody's really strong. Everyone's capable of yes. incredible strength. And, but yet, you know, for example, in this story, um, uh, there's, it's, it's um, Athene who basically curses uh, Medusa. There's no, where are the conscious feminists in? Are there any conscious I have terrible news for you. <laughs> <laughs> are there any conscious feminists no. in the the not, not as world. much as you might hope. I mean, there are some, there is some unconscious feminism going on. For example, the, the great monologue that Medea delivers at the beginning of Euripides' version of her story um, is so extraordinary on the um, subject of how awful it is to be a woman in a loveless marriage to a terrible man mm. um, and the condition of women in general being disadvantaged relative to men, that it was still being read at suffrage meetings 110 oh, right. years okay. ago. Well, and I it's like, well, that was written by a man, it was performed by a man wearing a mask, almost certainly to an audience of just men whose wives were locked up at home, basically. And yet, it, it's, a, it's an extraordinary discursus on, on women's lives. And, and Euripides does that more than once. There's an incredible moment in the Phoenician women where Jocasta talks about having had her baby taken from her and given to another woman. And she uses such physical language. She says, she nursed the child my labor pains produced. And it's like, how do you know that when you would never have seen a woman give birth? Because that would be dealt with by midwives and, and uh -huh. women. And you'd be outside in the men's quarters. You wouldn't be anywhere near your wife because you were rich and therefore you'd have been... And, and how would you know about milk when wet nurses existed and, and wives wouldn't have been... It? How did you know? How did you know her body would ache for this baby? How did you know that another woman's body would respond to it like that? Maybe it wasn't, maybe it was a female, you know, who... who it cannot been? have been. Alas, there is evidence for <laughs> Euripides all over the shop. So, yeah, he's real, I'm afraid, and he's definitely a man. Although in um, Arist an Aristophanes play called The Poet and the Women, he does disguise himself as a woman to escape the furious women of Athens because he's been so rude about them. So, okay, so there know, is maybe. There is that sort of sojourner truth kind of, ain't I a woman? Um, this is what women, this is, this is the um, pain we go through, this is who we are, does exist. It does exist, but we would be, it would be revisionist beyond where I'm prepared to go, and I'll go quite a long way okay. to call him a feminist, <laughs> but I will go a long way for it. But I, you know, I, I would, I consider Euripides a feminist writer, but I for sure wouldn't call him a feminist. Okay, so when I read that chapter myself, I think one of the things that stood out for me was just one line, which was something to do with his sort of, fishy, fishy, the, his clammy, clammy, clammy hand. Yeah. And I thought, I don't know why, I just thought that was just a sort of exquisite um, detail because obviously um, this is a kind of Harvey Weinstein of, <laughs> isn't it? This is a, this is a, I've cornered you in my temple, ha ha ha, 
I've got you now. And, and it's, just, it's just so loaded with, um, uh, gosh, you know, that this is, uh, this is what's going to happen to this girl. But she's answering back, she's answering back. You filled in all the gaps, and yet um, it's, it's, this is a contemporary scenario. Um, can you talk a bit about, yeah, the, have we evolved, you know, I, have we evolved? I mean, I think some of us have evolved, <laughs> but for sure some of us have not. And, you know, it was, it's that thing where... Was there Harvey Weinstein in this when you were thinking about Poseidon? Of course I was thinking about him, how can you oh. not? You know, there's a scene yeah. later where he's sort of sunning himself on a rock and kind of admiring himself, and at the same time there's this sort of tiny voice of self-doubt, which my Olympian deities very rarely experience, but occasionally do, um, where he wonders what he would look like to a critical female eye. And it makes him really, he gets suddenly really like, oh, I, something's wrong. You know, he's like, I look so lush and, and marvelous and godly. And then he's like, do I look like a horrible fat seal? Yes. And then he's like, no, no, I'm lush. And, and then he can just, this, this female voice of criticism. It's that great, incredible Margaret Atwood line that informs everything all of us write all the time, I suppose, that, you know, men are afraid that women will laugh at them and women are afraid that men will kill them. Um, yes, and yeah. And that's yeah. doubly true with male yeah. gods, at least the way that I write them. But yeah, absolutely, that, that sense of enormous self-regard with that constant tiny voice at the back of it saying, yeah. she thinks you're disgusting. Yeah. Seems to me, having you know, never met him and, and hoping never to, exactly how the Harvey Weinsteins of this world operate. Yeah, totally. Um, there's something, it's, this is really, it's funny. There's loads of great one-liners. Thanks. Um, and very contemporary, and as you just said, something about it, the awareness of it being um, a feminist, uh, con you know, a feminist of today. Um, and the whole, and this, for me, invigorates the story. It's, it's, it's not just a retelling in terms of plot, mm. or, you know, you've, you've, you've done different things, but in form, um, throughout, in, uh, you know, your narrative choices in one particular bit, which I'm not allowed to talk about <laughs> because it's a spoiler. But there's so much going on here. But, but it, for me, what I liked most about it was just this kind of lightness. It's, um, it's dancing and it's just a very relatable, as Lisa just brought it to life. The awareness, it's like, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? You know, what are you talking about? So it, the, the female consciousness is so at odds to uh, the, pa the patrician, like, this is how things are. And she's just like, oh, I'm not, not getting this at all. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I'm, I'm glad that it's a funny book and certainly structurally, it's quite a playful book. I love a polyphonic novel. I love changing voices yeah. all the time. And I'm fearless in the face of like, maybe this chapter should be narrated by an olive grove or by a crow. Or by a reed, yeah. Or, or a reed mm. or whatever. You know, whoever we need will step up and do the job. And it was, Really, the hardest thing actually was trying to keep the the tone sort of moving like that in a kind of it should feel like a wave breaking on a, a shore because I didn't want to kind of slam you into a wall when it goes from it goes from comedy to tragedy quite often and quite quickly mm. um, and it's like have I have I held this tone enough for you I to come with me I did feel I was here. in safe hands. I didn't know glad. that you knew. I always thought she knows what's coming. I did know. I did feel I was in safe hands. Yeah, I, I did, did know, know that it was very pacey because there's so much drama. Yes. There's so much drama. It's, like, it's, it's a pace. Because I drama. love Aristotle's poetics. So, again, you said that it's a small story, um, but this is not a small story. There's lots going on here. And you've kind of weaved um, Perseus, Andromeda, Ethiopians, um, the Danai, the Grai. There's so much, you've just sort of like weaved a, a world and it's because you, un, you know this world. And I was like, oh, okay. Real, there was real confident storytelling here. I guess I wanted to ask you, and there's a, there's a terrible thing that happens. And I'm not, I can't say where I, I wept, I wept in the middle of this book. Yeah. It's terrible. It, what, what you decided to do with this, in the center of this book, what you decided to do with this I think is kind of important piece of contemporary feminism, if I'm honest. And I was just like, you know, you kind of, it, as a writer to writer, I, 
Sometimes books just make me stop. Sometimes I want to throw it on the ground. Sometimes I have to go make. A, I kind of had those reactions to that that bit. Can you talk a bit about your thinking about what you wanted to do? Maybe even well t towards that part, or you know, weaving these stories together. And you've spent a lot of time with the sisters. It's a story of friendship, of sisterhood, it is. of caring, of, of family of how these strange creatures live together in a cave and how she's cared for and she's not mortal. So you do a lot of, in, we invest, invest, invest in, in what's really going on between these sisters, um, which makes what happens incredibly tragic. How did you get all of that from such a small story? What, I know you mentioned that you wrote a lot of this in lockdown. Yeah, I did. I, I mean, I feel really bad saying this because my mom's here tonight, um, but, during the second or third lockdown, I've lost track now, I started this book in sort of November, December time of 20, and then wrote it through to September of 21. So for a really long chunk of that time, the first, at least half of that first draft, we couldn't see each other. I couldn't see my mom, she's 100 miles away. I couldn't see my brother and sister-in-law and niece. They're, you know, 20 miles the other way. My dad was in, you know, 100 miles the other way. It's like, I can't... I can't say, so I basically wrote myself a new family <laughs> to keep me company. Um, and then obviously realized they were really great company and I slightly preferred them to my, not my mom. Um, <laughs> so that, that was sort of part of it. And then I think the scene that is so harrowing in the middle, I guess it's probably not a spoiler to tell you that Perseus and, and Medusa are on a collision course um, because it's the most famous part of her story. Um, and, uh, and obviously there's a, there's a Gorgon head on the front cover. I mean, I can't get around it. Um, but narrating that part, which was, I think, the question you asked me before the mic went out, um, I had planned for a while to do the thing that I Just chose that. to. Yeah, yeah, and I texted my friend Robert. Um, we text each other every day once just to you know, check in. I texted my friend Robert and said, I'm thinking of narrating the beheading scene like this. Is that insane? And we text every day, but we hardly ever speak any other way. It's just like one message to and fro. I send him a picture, he sends a reply. Um, and not a smutty picture, don't get ideas. Um, and he rang me. He just rang me straight back and said, you have to do this. That's absolutely what you should do. Not just how in form, but did he also say, this is what you're going to do? He said, I what said, are you do can I do this thing? How are you going to do it? Can I do this thing with this thing, with this chorus of these characters? And he rang me and said, yes, do it, do it right now. Yeah. And we talked for about 20 minutes. Um, he said they should be a Beckettian chorus, Lisa. So I don't know if they are. Well, you're you're going to win a Beckett. prize for that. Just, <laughs> that, I just, you know, again, as a writer to writer, there's only now and again, you just like put something down and you go, I wish I'd written that. Or that's an amazing piece of writing. That's just, you know, you've met oh, contemporary classic out of a, out of classic writing, it's just amazing piece of writing. Thank the kind you. Kind of thing I'm going to show my creative writing students. Shut up! You'll make me cry again. It's Lisa's really great. It. It, we can't talk about it. You're going to have to buy the book. I don't but want to spoil it. It's such amazing. a long way through. It is one of the best pieces of writing I've seen for a long time, and it is going to. It is a bit of a. It is a sort of. It's kind of hat trick. It's a. It's a good. It's a good bad thing, and and part of me when I stop reading and thought. I wonder if that's that's the story you wanted to tell right from the word go. Is yes, it was. Yeah. Exactly. I think we should just tell them what it it's, is. It's one of those goosebump things. I feel weird now. You want to tell? Yeah, all right. So You tell. So um, what I wanted to do for a really long time was write the scene where Perseus decapitates Medusa from the perspective of the snakes that are her hair because I thought it would be cool. Um, and also that I couldn't imagine that anyone else would ever have done it. And that's always the thing when you kind of try and encounter these narratives anew, is that you want to make them, you want to, uh, you know, you asked me earlier about the kind of revising it in a feminist light. And it's sort of, it's impossible not to do that now. It's like, this is the 21st century. I am a feminist. Whatever I write is going yeah. to reflect that. And when people say, did you set out to write a feminist book? Well, I set out to be a feminist and write a book. So yeah, I guess so. I breathe feminist air by that rationale. So yeah, you know, in my feminist way, I'm just going for my feminist walk. And that, so there's an element of that. But, okay, but it's not just the snakes that is like, this is really cool. But, but can I say this? I don't know. You're going to give away the end of that chapter. What, with the bit, the bit that like, <laughs> Thank goodness you don't have a microphone on, Monique. 
But then I say, well, but he he kills her when she's asleep. He kills her when she's asleep. I mean, I just want to when she's just like yeah, he throw does. myself on the floor and just like, that's the end of my day. I can't read it. I'm not doing anything anymore now. Yeah, and I didn't I was like, that. when did you think of that? I didn't have to. It's on a vase in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Is it? It is. It's a hydria. <laughs> it's about 50 centimetres tall. And... Uh, and, and there's, it is the most beautiful picture of her. She is very unusually at this stage in the story, she's a beautiful young woman because it's the fifth century and they make monsters pretty. Mm. Um, before that, you'll get gorgons with big wide mouths and tusks and everything. After that, they all look like beautiful women. All monsters get more pretty okay. in the fifth century. Everyone gets prettier. Yeah. Um, and so <coughs> she's a beautiful young woman at the moment when she's killed, which is she doesn't seem to have snakes for hair. She's just got ringlets beautiful ringlets I might add and she's asleep and Perseus is sneaking up on her and there's no other word for it he's on tiptoe like he's deliberately trying to make the least noise possible and he's got this curved sword it's called a harpe it belongs to Zeus his father and it fits perfectly around her neck and as he does it he's looking behind him he's wearing a hat which belong, uh, it's the hat of Hades. It belongs to Hades, so it makes him invisible. He's wearing winged shoes uh, or sandals that belong to Hermes, so he can get away really fast. He's got a bag. Um, I can't remember if you can see it in this image or not. Um, it's a cabesis. It's given to him by the Hesperides, the nymphs that live in the Garden of Hesperides, which is near the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and, uh, and that's also therefore on loan from another deity. So he's got help from all these different gods. And he's looking behind him as he reaches out to, to try and kill her. And behind him is Athene offering him advice. And it's like he can't bear to look. That's why he's turning away. And also, of course, he's afraid of her because if she opens her eyes, he'll die. But also, he's getting this advice from a super powerful goddess. And what it looks like when you look at this vase painting is exactly what it is. You know, we're so used to the version in Clash of the Titans where she's where she, armed with, with a bow and arrow. Things, she's, yeah. you know, she's super dangerous. And when we see this beautiful Hydria in the Metropolitan Museum, we see what it is, which is a man Killing with a sword a beheading sleep. a sleeping woman. Yeah. And it is, it's, it's a deliberately ambivalent artistic it's response. It's a terrible thing. So this... This vase is where I, I stole that part of the story from. And yeah. so when I said I nicked it from these sort of snapshots, I wasn't kidding, you know, it's really a thing. It reminds me of like, you know, when you hear about hunters like shooting hibernating bears or something. Yeah, it's like, well done you, on you Well brave. done, that's yeah. heroic. Yeah, and, another and victory for team trying really hard. Yeah, and something to do with my mermaid as well, you know, big game hunting and, you know, killing sleeping creatures. Um, so uh, we're also going to go with that. And there's also, I mean, so prior to all of this, um, she's binding her eyes. She doesn't want to come out of the cave. She's, she kills a scorpion by accident. She goes, oh my God, this is awful. I, and I so know, there's bonus so much, fact. I'm so afraid of scorpions. I had to story. ask someone else what they look like because I can't um, look at a picture of one. <laughs> <laughs> but you've rewritten the story in minutely so you've given us this feminist and feminine awareness you've built this family and she's you know not a monster which um because you know she's trying her best to stay away from looking at people binding her eyes she gets killed in her sleep the snakes tell the story it's amazing and um so something here not just about a feminist retelling but about a revision of what hero heroism is yes totally i i mean i hope so because for, by the standards of his time, and indeed later times, Perseus is a hero because he's the son of a god and because gods line up to help him. And there's also another way of looking at that, which I think is sort of inherent in that vase painting, which is to say, who needs help from all those different gods? Someone really weak. Yeah. And that obviously is the funnier version. I mean, if you're going to write a character version. across the whole novel. But there's always pictures of him as well. I've, again, I've done a bit, you know, look online, Perseus, you know, boom. And he's this sort of, you know, perfectly, you know, holding the head of the Gorgon with a spear and he looks amazing and he's killed the Gorgon. And you've completely upended that. I have. You're completely like... Because you could be young and handsome, which he is, and muscled and strong and all of those things, and mm. still not be heroic. And I would still argue that killing a woman asleep, or indeed a Gorgon asleep, isn't a very heroic act. Oh, no. And in terms of no. her binding her eyes, this is an example of, I guess, trying to, trying to build the story out of absence rather than presence in the ancient world. There is no surviving, as far as I know, evidence of Medusa killing anyone 
until she's used as a weapon after her death. And I'd never yeah. seen that until I wrote her chapter in Pandora's Jar, her non-fiction chapter. I thought, like everyone else, I think, well, she's a monster, she kills people. And it's like, well, wait, who? Who does she kill? And I went through the Ovid really carefully. It's like, oh, right, no one. She kills no one. And so from there, it became really easy to say, well, this is somebody who is afflicted with this tremendous lethal power, who, who doesn't want it and tries her absolute hardest mm. not to use it. And um, you flip the whole thing of who's a monster, you know. Is she a monster? No. No, she's not. No. She's, a, she's my girl. She's just a person who's poor thing, lives in a cage, cave. Um, she's humanised and we see the gods as monsters here. It's just awful. It's a terrible world. And again, going back to what, you know, why do we, what is, you know, how did we ever um, respect, show any respect for these these people? Well, you don't have to respect them. You just have to be afraid of them, right? I mean, if you're afraid of thunder and lightning, and who wouldn't be, or earthquakes, Greece, Italy, later, mm. um, absolutely riddled with these problems, then y you would just be afraid, right? You know, if, if you're afraid of suddenly yeah. dying of a plague, something we couldn't imagine five years ago, but now I think probably find quite easy to imagine, it's really easy to see why you might be afraid of Apollo, who suddenly fires arrows at you, and that's plague. And you can see why somebody like Agamemnon might be willing, you know, to do as much as, as you know, sacrifice his own child to appease a, a goddess, Artemis, that he's offended. Mm. And, and so, yeah, I guess I think sometimes it's harder for people, it's harder for people to unpick contemporary religious feeling from ancient religious yeah. gods because I don't think they necessarily require the same the same response. Sometimes you don't have to respect something to be scared of it. Yeah. Yeah. But they are monstrous because they're pure ego, as you said. They're basically like toddlers well, with superpowers. I was superpowers. just thinking, you know, Boris is a classicist, isn't he? And, and so I just wonder about, you know, you're sort of saying we don't have to, but, you know, our leaders do, you know, our leaders do respect or fear or, you know, the, they, they get into this, these stories are part of the bedrock of our collective unconscious, you know. And um, Bacchus, Apollo, Dionysus, all these, these, these you know, they, people tend to self-identify as, you know, grandiose and, you know, uh, you know, why, you know, me, you know, me, of course. Look at Donald Trump, you know, pushing all those leaders out of the way. Some, somewhere along the line, I can't help but thinking that there is some kind of unconscious blueprint for behaviour that has been... Am I right or wrong? Am I? I don't know. I, I mean, it's a much more tempting blueprint if you're a man, for sure, because then you basically, it's like, you know, you can do basically whatever you like because mm. yeah, you've got the power. Yeah. Well, that, and I think the archetypes that yeah. surround female deities are probably a bit more complex. Nobody wants to be Hera because she's always jealous and punishing people. Um, so she's become a sort of archetype of like a, a sort of shrewish housewife whose husband always strays. But when you look at the actual archaeology of lots of parts of ancient Greece, like Argos, for example, not the shop, don't be childish, um, then the temple to Hera is vast. It is vast. And you realize that for women, she, she may punish the nymphs and human girls and goddesses that Zeus rapes horribly, and she does, and sometimes the offspring of those um, encounters like Hercules, Heracles, to give him his Greek name. Um, but she is also the goddess who, who stands up for, protects and represents married women and indirectly childbirth. You know, her daughter is the goddess of childbirth, Eletheia. And it's like, well, these temples are really big. I don't think they come just from a place of fear. There must be, impossible as it seems to us when we read later versions of her story, there must be affection for Hera however monstrous she is. Artemis makes a bit more sense because she sort of represents a, a kind of perpetual girlhood where you don't have to get married. You can kind of be free and it's a much more mm. kind of um, idyllic rural existence that she represents. I get loads and loads of, of young women who are, whose hearts I know I'm breaking by writing Athene the way I've, I've written her because they want her to be their sort of feminist superhero. And it's like, I hear what you're saying, but there's a moment in the Eumenides when she, uh, a play, the play by Aeschylus, where she specifically says, you know, I don't value 
women. I, I value men. You know, I don't have a mother. I've got a father, Zeus, because um, she's born fully formed from his head. So she doesn't value the role that motherhood plays at all. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> but you, but you love women. She doesn't love women. She's ne she never once stands up for women. Um, she, you know, she's always defending male heroes like Odysseus. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, on the subject of, of well, women, and I was going to get a sex question in there somewhere. Um, women. I am here for your sex question. <laughs> okay, let's get the sex question out of the way as well. Um, is it true, do you think, that generally in these stories, non-consenting sex, i.e. rape, is basically what sex is all the yes. time? It's just non-consent. It's rape. In myth, yes. Myth. Yeah. Sex equals I rape. I mean, by the time you get and into history, there, there, must, there must have been couples who are nice. Yeah. <laughs> that had to happen just statistically. Um, but yes, I mean, um, when you have a world with such a widespread acceptance of slavery, and yes, I always feel like I have to say this when I talk about slavery in the ancient world, there are more slaves in the world now than there were in the ancient world. There are more people. Um, but slavery isn't a problem that's gone away, and pretending that it's just in the past would be beneath us all, and therefore I acknowledge and register that that's the case. But there's a, a widespread acceptance of slavery, which means that there's a huge and ever-present population highly visible of people who are basically treated like objects, in which case there is no possibility of consent because those people have no authority over th themselves yeah. as, as okay. bodies, as embodied people. Um, and so male and female, they would have been raped with impunity, I'm afraid. And I think it's very hard to imagine that if you lived in a culture which was so accepting of something which to us is rightly horrific, it's very hard to imagine that people well, in that culture say, would so see it in any other way. thinking about that, um, and these myths, okay, they're Western, um, but Western culture, you know, they... I mean, what, what effect has all of this had on us over the, what, last 4,000 years or so? Do you think this is... Can we, can we go, you know, um, there are still the same amount of slaves, there's still, you know, non-consenting sex, it's still... Um, are these, I mean, do you think these myths have got, got into the, you know, got into, into the way we think generally? It's still hard. <clears throat> it's still hard. These things are still... I wonder if it's the other way around. I wonder if the myths, I think I think the myths are so violent and non-consensual because people are. I think we make gods in our image. Um, there's a, a famous quote from Xenophanes, um, that if uh, horses had hands, then their gods would look like horses. He says, if they could draw, that, that they would make gods in their image, just as we yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. And so I tend to think the reason that these gods oh, so and goddesses, but particularly gods, okay. are so awful is because men with power uh -huh. behaved awfully. And when you have absolute tyrants and dictators, um, something which we're seeing a sort of strange flirtation with again at the moment in countries which have had democracy for a long time, it, it becomes easier to believe, I think. If, if that's the world you grow up in, then Zeus would seem entirely normal. Plausible. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Sorry, that's quite okay, a depressing no, answer. Coming to my last questions, one of them was... Um, so, Tony Wolfe, who was the lover of Jung, and uh, also she wrote about this archetype, female archetype, the Hetara. Yes. Which is um, a Greek... Um, it is. And she self-identified as a sort of educated concubine, somebody who was out, was included in the world of men and sexually active on her own terms. And Simone de Beauvoir said the same thing. She also self-identified. And I'm wondering about this Hatara archetype, um, given that today women, um, two in 10 born in the year, I'm born in child-free, um, we're educated, we have agency, we have subject, subjectivity, both in life and in fiction and art. And I'm just wondering about the Satara being an old um, Greek archetype, mm -hmm. but not one we hear about more. Uh, can you talk a little bit about it doesn't really she exist was until in the Greek fifth myth century. And, and today's She's woman. not really in Greek myth, she's in Greek history, I'm afraid, rather okay. more harrowingly. Um, so it's a very specific status that you get in, for example, Athens, where citizenship is very closely guarded. Um, so in order to be a citizen in Athens, you have to have two Athenian citizen parents. But here's the thing. Women can't really be citizens because they have no citizen rights. So you can only be the daughter of a citizen man, and he had better have married a daughter of a citizen <coughs> man, uh -huh. um, and so on and so on. And so Hetairai, um 
occupy a sort of strange liminal status. Bing, uh, right, extra point for your exam. Um, but they uh, occupy this liminal status in which they are born not in Athens, but in another part of the Greek world. So Aspasia is the most famous, the yeah. um, Hetaira, uh, who spent lots of time with Pericles and was eventually, uh, he, they eventually married, although their marriage wasn't recognized under the Athenian legal system because she wasn't an Athenian woman. Um, and then you had the chance of having a much freer life relative to Athenian wives who lived an entirely cloistered life. The, the more rich a family was, the, m the more lack of freedom these women would have had. They would have lived in women's quarters and they would have seen no male person at all other than very close relatives, brother maybe, husband yes, yeah. son yes. And that was it, father, I guess, but not you know cousins or anything like that, unless they were accompanied by their husband. So it doesn't look like a very desirable existence. Hetairai, meanwhile, might be at you know a lovely symposium with Socrates and Aristophanes and you know Plato and um, Pericles, hanging out, chatting, talking philosophy. It sounds like much more fun, except that we don't get any evidence at all of Athenian women running away to become hetairai. And we do have evidence, there's a legal speech from the fourth century uh, called the Against Neaira, um, of a hetaira trying to pass herself off as an Athenian citizen wife. So what looks to us in the 21st and indeed to Beauvoir, et cetera, in the 20th century, like a life of relative freedom, perhaps didn't seem so to women two and a half thousand years ago, although it's difficult for us to mm. comprehend that. that that the, perhaps the benefits of having your children acknowledged as citizens were so great relative to your own personal freedom, it was a sacrifice that you were willing to make. Okay, all right. My um, potted history of Hetairai. <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, I, I'm, I was conscious of this, of this archetype and I'm conscious of the 21st century giving birth to um, a new archetype that we rarely see in old stories, which has led me to rewrite old stories. Mm -hmm. In old stories, in ancient stories, women are either virgins to be raped, mothers, crones, witches or whores. And um, which is for me the reason why I want to rewrite stories is because where's me, you know, where's, yes. where's the educated sort of um, roller skating writer who, I don't know, you know, I don't know, gardens, chili peppers, or, you know, does anything, yeah. they, does anything, where's the free woman in old stories? They don't exist. It's so. true. Our best case scenario is fun witch, <laughs> which I will take at a push, <gasps> yeah. as archetypes go. Yeah, fun witch. One more question before we go to um, the audience. Something about healing. Well, B is waving at us. Are we getting a wave? Oh, we're going to do a reading. Okay, um, can I have a quick, quick quizzy? Quick, oh, do we have time? Yes. All right, quick question. My final question was about healing. I was always led to believe that myth is a form of mental health. Uh, good mental health come, myth, myth and mental health. Um, myth heals us. Something about these are stories we've told ourselves. They come from our unconscious. They come from our shadow. They come from bits and pieces of us. Um, thrown up, thrown into stories so we can comprehend. And when we read stories, old stories, you know, Red Riding Hood, you know, any, all of it comes from... That's a new story to me. That's a new story, <laughs> I know. Uh, but it's something to do with healing um, us. Why do we make art? Why do we tell stories? There's no functionality apart from our mental health, really. We kind yes. of like... And these stories don't feel healing at all. These are all, these are all terrible stories about rape and killing and beheading. Can you say a bit more? I think myths are a mirror. They show us ourselves. And that's why myths have multiple timelines. So this story, Stone Blind, is a story based on myth which dates back, you know, the Bronze Age is when this is set. Ooh. So, you know, more than 3,000 years ago. Yeah. And then it's a story which is retold by, you know, very briefly by Hesiod. He's approximately contemporary with Homer. So let's mm. say 7th century BCE. And then it's told again. You know, there's a lost play called The Forkidas, The Daughters of Forkis. So it was told in the 5th century as a, as a dramatic thing. Uh -huh. We've only got two tiny fragments of it, God damn it. Um, and then Ovid takes it on, 1st century BCE into CE. And he, he looks at it and gives us a different version of it. At the same time, all those artists that we thought about are painting those incredible vases, sometimes with a very sympathetic version of the story, sometimes less so. And then the Renaissance happens and 
you know, Cellini or Canova take on. Neoclassicism happens, and then we have more versions of Perseus, more versions of Medusa. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what are we doing here, I'm, here I come along and go, okay, yeah. well, this is my version, and it's to, sh it's to show you my, my reading of this story has all those timelines in it too because I've read them all or looked at them all, and they're all there, super thin, so that you can still see the story through the whole thing. But of course, my lens is 21st century and feminist. And so this is my reading, and hopefully in the future, someone else will want to tell it differently again. And I think we have to show ourselves to ourselves, and these stories are a way in which we do that. We say, what is it yeah. that I'm unhappy about in this world, or happy yeah. about in this world, or who am I, or who are they, or how can I work out who I am in relation to them? Storytelling shows us ourselves, yeah. and that can happen in something as extraordinary as you know, the Iliad, or as tiny as a short story by Borges, or as minuscule as you know a, a couple of stanzas of poetry, these these modes of art show us who we are mm. if we choose to look. Yeah, I agree completely. I totally agree, absolutely. And and then yeah, I mean, kind of kind of agree. I mean, and they're healing as well mm. to kind of ruminate again and again and again. Who are we? What happened? Yeah. What happened? Do you remember when? Oh God, can we hear it again? All of that. Yeah, and that's why we like hearing the same stories again. I think yeah. it's one of the reasons children that's like to hear the same story yeah. and they go bananas if again, you change yeah. it. You know, it's like, well, because there's something safe in this. Yeah. And it, you're learning how this, you're learning how stories work, but you're also learning where you fit in this story, I yeah. think. Totally, totally. Um, I think we're going to end there because we've got more reading and question from the audience. But for now, can we have, give it up for Natalie? I'm wondering if you still think of her as a monster. I suppose it depends on what you think that word means. Monsters are what? Ugly? Terrifying? Well, Gorgons are both of these things, certainly, although Medusa wasn't always. Can a monster be beautiful? Beautiful if it is still terrifying? Perhaps it depends on how you experience fear and judge beauty. And is a monster always evil? Is there ever such thing as a good monster? Because what happens when a good person becomes a monster? I feel confident saying that Medusa was a good mortal. Has that all disappeared now? Did it fall out with her hair? Because I think you already know why the snakes were so anxious that she cover her eyes when they heard her sister approaching. But that's another question for another day. I suppose, do snakes have emotions? Are they capable of anxiety? but let's just focus on the question in hand. They knew before Medusa knew that her gaze was now lethal. She found out a day or two later when she tried to remove the bindings from her eyes. She turned her gaze on something she could see moving across the ground in front of her, a quick dark streak on the golden sand, and it stopped, mid-run. She reached out and picked it up, dropped it straight away when she realized she was holding a scorpion picked it up again when she understood that it was dead. It took her a moment to work out what was wrong. It was the wrong texture for a scorpion. She had, perhaps this shouldn't need saying, but just in case, never held a scorpion in her hands before. She knew their sting could be fatal. She also knew how shiny they were, how slick their shells appeared. And this was rougher to the touch than a scorpion should be, and surely it was too heavy, given its size. She took it and kept it and puzzled over it. But she doubted her own eyes, and who could blame her after they had sustained such an insult? She wondered if she hadn't seen it move, if it was a tiny statue of a scorpion that had washed up on the shore, or perhaps one of her sisters had found it in a human settlement nearby and brought it to show her and then forgotten to tell her about it. None of these explanations seemed to her to be less plausible than the truth, that she had looked at the scorpion and it had turned to stone. It would take two more days, two dead birds, a cormorant, a bee-eater, before she understood the truth. Hi, I'm 
one of the things that I really loved about Stone Blind, is this working? <laughs> that I really loved about Stone Blind and also A Thousand Ships was the, like, the many narratives all woven together. And I was quite interested in just the practicalities of writing it and if you know from the start which perspectives you're going to include and which order they come in or if that's something that kind of grows through the process of writing. Yes, some of them I do. Um, I'm still really... F I know it sounds really mad, but I'm still, I can't quite understand how you've read Stone Blind because I haven't given it to you. Do you know, it's only been out for such a short time. I'm like, wait, where did you find it? It's like, probably in a shop. Oh uh, yeah. It's like, how can this be? Uh, it's gonna take me a few more months, I think, before I'm not baffled each time. But yeah, no, I start out knowing some of them. Um, but this book particularly, I thought I would write, for once, I thought I would write a single voice and it was like, that didn't last like, two minutes and I spent weeks thinking I would and I was like no 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 um, and I was like well maybe if I had this one voice at the beginning I'm like yeah that's not how no it's not gonna and then really quickly I worked out that I wanted more recurring voices you know ships has has more you know the recurring voices are Calliope and Penelope but generally the Trojan women are third person so it returns to them generally you get somebody once and then they go and this time I knew I would keep coming back to Andromeda I would keep coming back to Danae and I would keep coming back of course to Medusa and her sisters and to Athene um, and so it, there were there were many more kind of pre-existing long threads that I decided on when I started and then the sort of individual voices where it's like could I do this bit you know could I could I just randomly go down? To, could this be, you know, the wife of Poseidon? Yeah. Could this be? Could could I do this voice from someone else's perspective? Could I take a bird? Could I take a a tree? Um, and I thought that would be, you know, fun as it went along. But I, I generally, I was pretty sure I'd do the olive grove. And when I realised I could have the crow, I yeah, I was like, oh, you're kidding me. This is going to be so much fun. And it was really fun. It was really fun to write. It was really fun to narrate. Um, when I did the audio book. So yeah, some of them just turned up sort of as, as I went. But I always know where the story's gonna begin and end, or mostly I do. I didn't with Jocasta. With Jocasta it surprised me. And I thought all the way through, I'm gonna tell people a story they already know and then 50 pages out from the end, I was like, wait, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so yeah, no, it changes, it changes as you go, which is good because otherwise it'd be like coloring in, you know? It'd be like if I'd planned it all, I would just feel like I was filling it in. I mean, the least convenient place to ask a question. It's a three part. It's character quickly. building for them. It is character building. So, three part. How old were you when you first encountered the ancient world? How did it make you feel? And how did that feeling influence your writing? Um, I don't know exactly how old I was when I first encountered the ancient world, but I've said this before, and again, I feel bad because my mum is here. But I know what I'm supposed to say is, oh, an extensive library of classical literature. And the answer is, Clash of the Titans. Um, <laughs> Because obviously Clash of the Titans, because you know it came out in 1981. I don't think we went to the pictures to see it. No, we didn't. My mum can confirm uh, that I saw it on TV, so probably a couple of years later, because young people, this is how it used to be. It was on at the cinema, and then you had to wait, just wait until someone put it on telly. And if they didn't like a film you liked, you could never see it again. That was the rules. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I was probably about, I don't know, eight or nine before I remember seeing that film. Um, and I must have read like the, I don't know, the puffin book of Greek literature or whatever, Greek myths before that, but I don't remember it. My brother does. He says we had that and a, Norse, a book of Norse myths as well, but I've no recollection. Um, and then I started studying classics at, at secondary school. So I started doing like Roman life or something at 11, Latin at 12, Greek at 14. So I was a massive nerd. So I remember loving the Ray Harryhausen films because they were so intricate. And although, again, they've, I know that the stop motion animation has dated. To me, it's still incredibly potent, you know? And, and so that, that sense of wonder that you had when those skeletal warriors rose from the ground and Jason and the Argonauts, that is, is ever present in my encounters with the ancient world, whether it's history or myth or, you know, studying any part of it. When archaeologists hang out with me, I still feel the same. It's like, what, how, really, are you sure? And that sense of... I, it must be awful to study and not feel it. And I know lots of people probably have that experience, but I'm very lucky and I move through the world in quite a wondering way. Mainly because most of you are baffling to me. Hmm? <laughs> Next. 
Do you speak any Greek? Modern Greek yeah. or ancient Greek? Uh, either. Oh, I can read ancient Greek and Latin, so I'm fine. <coughs> I've just come back from Corfu. I was doing Corfu Literary Festival, which, yes, is a job. Um, <laughs> and by the time I checked into my hotel, um, me and the man on the desk had discussed why Homer and Hesiod weren't taught properly in Greek or English schools. Oh. Um, and I hadn't even got my key before he said, I'm going to have to buy you a beer so we can discuss this further. And then he gave, and a Greek beer is usually made by mythos, very mythos, pleasingly yeah. the word for me. Or myth. Helios. Yeah, so <laughs> we sat there drinking mythos. Well, I did, he was very professional and having coffee. Um, and discussing Greek myth. And I was like, this doesn't happen when I check into like the Premier Inn and <laughs> in the Midlands or wherever I am. Uh, not in the Midlands, I'd be staying with my mum, obviously. Um, so you, but read, you read I can ancient, read ancient Greek. And you can yeah. speak modern Greek. I can't speak modern Greek. I can um, read modern Greek enough because so much of it is like... Okay. But yeah, no, I'm hopeless. Modern Greek is completely different. And so Latin? Latin, yes. You speak Latin? I can read Latin. You read Latin. Yeah, only the Pope speaks Latin. And there's I don't, a, but I was trying to say... And his, his Latin. terrible church Latin. And there's also a radio station, I should say, that broadcasts in Latin brilliantly and insanely. Um, so yeah, I can read my way around Italy and modern Greece. Um, but I can't talk to anyone while I do it. Okay. Which must be nice for them, I would think. Hi. Um, hi. Can we have this question and then B's question, because we haven't got sound on B. Would that be okay? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, what advice would you give to people who want to write fiction in the mythological slash classical slash ancient world? I mean, go for it. There's a, huge, there's a huge movement for it at the moment. I'm kind of thinking, I've got to keep running till it runs out, so don't all lose interest, because I've got like three more books to write. Um, and then I might have some time off. But yeah, now's the time to be doing it. Everyone's mad for myth. So yeah, I think every generation rediscovers myth and Greek myth almost in particular. And I, there are various reasons for that. My feeling is that Greek myth very specifically centers people. Um, which you don't see necessarily in a myth cycle that centers on a giant tree or whatever. Um, not to diss the tree, but the tree's not going to write a book. In fact, if anything, the tree would rather you didn't write a book because then it would have a longer life probably um, and less papery one. Um, so, but yes, of course you should and, um, and hurry up before everyone moves on to Norse myth or something. I, I, sorry, I also do a bit of this as well. And everyone loves my mermaid and, and they sort of think I made the story up. I didn't, no, I didn't make it up. It was a story. I've, I've, you know, I've developed it or it was an old, everyone always asked me about my mermaid story. I'm like, it's not mine. I didn't invent that story. It I was an old it's story. it's an act of making and, it your own though. But I've made it my own, yeah. yeah. And they're like, why did the women do that? And I'm like, I didn't write that bit. That's the old <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah. But also I think there's that, um, the bone structure, which is so unconscious that I think we, we do, it, unconsciously um, understand archetypal story structure, archetypal characters, um, who's the goody, who's the baddie, what should and shouldn't happen. Yeah. It's immensely gratifying. It's like, it's like built-in good plot, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I suppose that in a way gives you a second answer, which is that you have to do your homework, mm. know the story really well. But who doesn't want to do that? It's literally my job to dick around looking at myth. B, have you got a question for us? Uh, we've got a question that's come through from our online audience. Um, it's from Anna Wharton. Thank you, Anna. She asks, how much evidence is there that it was Athene who cursed Medusa and not Poseidon? She says, I was unsure whether Medusa was cursed the way she was so she couldn't speak of the crimes that had been done to her, e.g. she was turned into the crazy ex not to be believed, or she was cursed because she had been raped in Athene's temple. Whatever the reason, she was punished for the crimes of a man. Of course she was. Um, there's no evidence that Poseidon curses her, I'm afraid, at least not a version of the story that I know, and I've been reading about it for ages. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, I know I don't want her to do it to either. I don't want Athena to be that person either, but she is, so we are where we are. It, it's, a, it's a source of great um, stress to us, I think, the way that rape survivors are treated in, in general, but in Greek myth, it's certainly no better than anywhere else. And we see it more than once that someone is essentially like, excommunicated by a god. A, a priestess like Cassandra is raped in a temple. And then the response is that she loses her, her priestly skill. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> Sorry, what? 
And the punishment for the guy who raped her is that he profaned the temple, not her body. And that's very hard for us to, to not be injured by anew, you know, it, and it, it hurts. But yeah, I, I wish I could tell you that it's just Poseidon is the only villain of this piece, but I'm afraid it's not so. That bit's true in the story. That is not a bit that you changed. That's not a bit that I changed. I really like how we're talking about truth in a story about <laughs> That's because, the yeah. true bit. Yeah. That's the true bit of the myth. Any other, there's a question, so people at the back. Oh, hello. Um, brilliant you. Um, so Salman Rushdie once said when he moved on from a book, he had to put the characters almost in a coffin in a box in a dark room so he didn't have to think about them anymore. And your plots are so clever, your characters are so vivid. How much do you actually have kind of a ceremony of, okay, now I'm done with you, you've got to be put away and I've got to think about the next thing? Um, that sounds a little bit like radio's superstar Anita Ronan to me. Um, I think it might just be. Um, I'm hopeless at putting characters away, I think. And I didn't realize I was as bad at it as I am until I was writing Pandora's Jar. And each chapter I thought, God, I could write a, ch I could write a whole novel about you and that was perfectly reasonable in the first chapter where it was about Pandora. And then in the second chapter, I thought, oh, maybe I'll do a novel about Pandora and maybe I'll do a novel about you as well. It's like, you've literally written a novel about Jocasta already. She's in the title. <laughs> and then it came to Helen. I was like, oh, and it's like, she's in a thousand ships. What is wrong? Every time I'm like, oh, come and be my friend. I, I approach everybody like a sort of anxious Labrador puppy without ever really you know, acknowledging that I'm done here. I just think I would come back into this story in a heartbeat. So at the moment, I feel like my time with Medusa was sort of, it felt like it was closed when I finished the first draft. And then of course, as you know, as the author of several very successful books, for example, The Patient Assassin uh, and the story of Koenor Diamond with William Dalrymple, um, that you take these stories and you think, okay, well, it's done now. And then the edits come back and you open it up again. And you're like, okay, let me reopen this toy box and move everyone around. And then, you know, you put it down and then you do the audio narration. You're like, okay, so here you are again, hanging out with me. And then you put it away and then you go on tour and you're like, well, here we are one more time, hi. So there's never a time when I feel, I feel vaguely like I move around the world with this sort of chorus of these women surrounding me, which almost certainly explains, Anita, why I'm single, I think. Um, because you can see that might be an intimidating prospect for all but the most sturdy of men. Um, and, and I don't even, I mean, I do, I say I don't blame them, of course I do, um, as a group, <laughs> and as individuals. Um, but yeah, they do, I don't feel like I ever put them away um, as much as I probably should do. But perhaps that's because they had such a long existence before I picked them up. I wonder if that's it. Oh, look, there's a whole, oh, look at this. There's 25 people with the hands up. <laughs> We can have one more. Okay, somebody needs, there needs to be a competition. How do we do this? Yes! <laughs> yes, the lady in the glitter, the glittery top. As some lack of agency is such a big theme in the ancient world, um, I was really heartened by your Spartan Women podcast that you've done oh, quite thanks. recently. And I wanted to just ask, in comparison to Medusa and the awful situation, situation, the awful, um, everything that happened to her. If that had happened in Spartan time with Spartan women, would that have been different? Would there have been a rallying in outrage against a, a Spartan woman being raped? It's a nice thought, isn't it? But it doesn't happen when Helen is raped. I mean, there's a war declared. Helen is kidnapped by Theseus of Minotaur fame um, when he is in his 50s and she is either seven or 10. And you know it's grim when ancient authors are squeamish. Um, and rounding up to the nearest 10. And her brothers, Castor and Polydeuces, we sometimes call them Pollux, um, invade Athens, which is where she's been taken to, um, to get her back. But in some versions of the story, she's already had Theseus's baby by the time she's recovered. So um, we, we, don't see, we, we don't see that story there. What we see is, is a much more traditional patriarchal story, which is that men go to war over the honor as they perceive it of women's virginity. Um, so yeah, I, I like your version better where the sort of 
you know, a band of Spartan women get to, you know, avenge themselves on. This is a more kind of Amazonian vibe, maybe. But yeah, I like this version. You should write this. I would totally blurb this book. <laughs> My agent is sitting at the front laughing because he knows I never blurb books. So I never have time to read them. He's doing a face which says, yeah, Natalie, like you'd say yes if I offered to send you that. And I'm enjoying every second of it. I feel really bad about your question. Do you want to ask me afterwards? Because you were right there and then it was taken from you. And I've, I've, I've got this, that sort of terrible l'esprit d'escalier on your behalf. All right. You're being very good about it. Okay. You can ask me afterwards if you want. All right. Thanks. Okay. On that note, yeah, I think that this is um, declared over. And there is um, snake bite. <laughs> there is actual snake bite to be drunk. I kid you not. And um, there are crowns to be had. There are books to be signed as soon as I get the first signing in. And there's chatting to be done amongst you all. Thank you all for coming very much. Thank you, Natalie. Monique. Pleasure.